Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the latest edition of Conversation with the Shipmate. I'm Lieutenant Caroline Hutchison, and we're here today with the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Jonathan Greener. Good morning, Admiral. Thank you so much for being here with us. It's great to be here, Carolyn. Let's get this out right now. It is Monday morning, 0800 on the 10th of March. So this is no banker's hours midday thing, right? We're hitting it early. That's right. We're starting <laughs> early, sir. And, and we're going to uh, talk about one of our favorite topics, the budget. Uh, so we'd really like to get your views, Admiral, on, sure. on how this budget impacts our Navy and the Navy family. You bet, sure. Um, first and foremost, um, one of the topics on a lot of folks' minds is the subject of compensation reform or, um, or sailors' compensation. Can you tell us a little bit about how, um, what the changes are and why we can't sustain the, the growth rate that we're on right now? Why do we need to make changes? Well, let's set the baseline maybe a little bit. Two years ago, the Department of Defense received what effectively a $500 billion reduction. And then just about a year and a half later, another $500 billion reduction. So as we look at, okay, how do we endure these, you know, the sequestration and then what took place before that, what are our options uh, to balance our force structure we have today, our future shipbuilding operations today, and of course the personnel accounts. As we look over the last, say, decade or so, actually two decades, uh, our compensation, that is the military's compensation, has grown at a, at a pretty good rate, and we've in fact made up for what was a deficit and folks have been, well, frankly, compensated pretty well. But it, that was the right thing to do. People have earned that compensation. So today, compensation in, for the military, and that, that's civilians and uh, uniform, is about one half of our budget. You know, some argue plus or minus, but it's fairly, fairly close. And that's about right, we figure. So we said, isn't it time to take a look at a comprehensive package, looking at pay, looking at housing, looking at TRICARE, looking at all of our benefits, and put together, if you will, a comprehensive package. And the term comprehensive means there's a lot of, of parts to it. And limit that growth. Hold it to about one half. And that's the essence of what's put together. In the, in the, when you get right down to it, that means about a 1% pay raise for a few years for our military and for civilians. So that's uniformed and civilian. And uh, we froze pay for uh, generals and uh, flag officers. So when you say slow the, the rate of growth, is, mm -hmm. does that mean there's not an actual cut? I mean, what's the bottom line for, for sailors' pay and, and for money in their pocket? Uh, it means what it said, slow the growth. So for example, instead of a 1.8% or 2.2% 2 .2 growth uh, pay raise, I should say, uh, we limit it to 1% pay raise. So it is a pay raise. When you look at uh, uh, allowance for housing, uh, instead of uh, five or six percent, four or five or six percent, which is what it has been, we limit that growth to say two, three, or four percent, and, and it, it varies by region. It, the the idea is to limit the growth, not reduce or not take out. Okay, and and how about um, you know sailors' future? What about retirement changes? Are are we going to see any changes there? Oh goodness, we keep seeing articles on that. No, let me I'll answer straight. No, there is no plan today to change retirement. This will take some time. There are folks studying it. There's a commission studying it. There will be articles on it as different. And, oh man, and they'll continue. But if, if I could make one thing clear, anybody who is wearing a uniform today, that retirement system will be grandfathered, which means that is their, today's retirement system is their retirement system. The only thing that might change is they may have the option, and I underline option, to transition to a new system if they want to. That is one that would come in for people who come into the military after it would be implemented. But I'll tell you, Carolyn, it's going to be a few years before we get uh, one put together, studied, voted on, and actually implemented. If you wear the uniform today, today is your retirement. Today's retirement system is your retirement system. That is definitely good to hear. I'm sure that a lot of folks will be reassured to hear that directly from, from you, sir. Um, I've also seen some articles on some proposed changes to tuition assistance mm -hmm. and maybe sailors paying a little more out of pocket. What's, what's going on with that? What are your thoughts? Well, uh, the Chief of Naval Personnel, Admiral Moran, and I have talked at length about what, what's the appropriate distribution for tuition assistance. And what I mean is, should we make it all, uh, if it's not really free, but how do we make sure that, that our folks get the right education? That's very important to me, to have an educated force. But they get the right education, and we aren't taking, uh, first of all, they're not getting ripped off by these 
Johnny Come Lately or whatever institutions out there that actually target that. Number two, they get something that is useful so that when they, while they're in the military and when they leave the military, the Navy, they, they're, it makes, it enhances their life. It accelerates their life, as we like to say. But anyway, uh, we looked at and toyed with, and right now in the budget is a 75 percent uh, Navy pays, 25 percent sailor pays. That's what's in the 15 budget right now. However, throughout the rest of this year, tuition is 100 percent, you know, Navy paid. But I'll tell you what, I'm rethinking. <laughs> and, and before we get to the fiscal year 15, uh, I may want to change and go back to what we have today, where Navy pays all of it. More on that later. Uh, I'm still thinking about it. Uh, to me, though, the bottom line is I want our kids to have the best education they can get. Absolutely. Um, Admiral, before you, you discussed some, some changes to the basic allowance for housing, or BAH, and mm -hmm. we've seen a 5% cut and then uh, something about renter's insurance. Can you yeah. elaborate on, on that a little bit and, and your thoughts on, on, on taking away uh, the BAH for, sure. for sailors? Well, um, again, I, I guess I wouldn't characterize it as taking away, but I know what you mean. All right, because it depends on how you look at it. But here's, here's what we would propose to do. This would be done incrementally. You don't do it right away. You don't have one year where you say, well, it's 0.95 of what it was last year. That's not the intent. It, uh, BAH has gone up consistently at, at a percentage that varies from 3 to 5 to 6, and I think it might have been a tad higher than that. I'm not sure exactly, but it's somewhere in that area. We would propose to limit that, that growth, and it would be inserted incrementally. So by, we would stop, if you will, that incremental limitation. When we reached a point, it would be no, no less than, or kids would receive no less than 5% out of pocket. Now, the, the other thing that today BAH provides is renter's insurance. And when you do the average on that, how much is renter's insurance? Does everybody get it? No, but it's free right now. BAH pays it. We'd say, we won't pay, uh, we would propose not to pay renter's insurance. That is an estimate of about 1%. So therefore, you got the 5%, which would be out of pocket for rent and mortgage, and the 1% for renters making it a total of 6 Does that make sense? That's where the 6% comes from. So bottom line, <clears throat> you're, you're not going to see a change in your next paycheck. And this yeah. could all depend on, on where you live and yes. where you're stationed. Yes. That's an important point. Thanks for bringing that up. Today, if I have a lease, I'm in San Diego, I'm in Norfolk, Mayport, you know, the PAC Northwest. I have a lease, I'm at a duty station. You won't see any change until you PCS. After you PCS and go to a new location, or in some cases you can PCS and stay in the same location, then you would look at and see, okay, you're under new rates for that area. That's when the transition would take place. So when you PCS, of course, you can redo your lease because orders, you, you have the, right. the, the clause in your orders. So it isn't going to happen where somebody is, you know, paying their mortgage, going about their business, and all of a sudden it's different. No, it'll happen with a duty station change. Okay, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, but I guess the bottom line here is that all of this is working towards cost savings. I mean, that's what you hear mm -hmm. proposed cuts and we need to save money. But where is all of this money going, the, the savings from the compensation reform and, and reductions? That's a good question. Let me, uh, and I'm glad you asked it, by the way. Let's go back to the beginning. Remember, we had these difficult choices to make. So the MCPON and I have been spending a lot of time asking around the Navy, you know, what's important to, to you all. And our sailors are very clear. Paying compensation is very important to us. But they've also made this clear. You know what's almost as important, just about as important, is where I work, uh, that I have proper manned, a proper manned division, that I get my schools, uh, so that's personal training, I get my professional training, that our unit trains right so I can do my job. I want spare parts so I can do PMS. I want tools. Uh, I want a decent place to live in if I'm a single sailor. I call that the quality of their work, their environment, you know. So the, the quality of their entire service, you know, their quality of life and their quality of work is kind of out of balance a little bit. So every penny that the Navy gets out of a compensation reform will go into uh, areas to improve quality of service and work. So let me, let me give an example, if I may. Say, what are you talking about? Uh, we would put that money into aviation spare parts, uh, surface maintenance and surface spare parts, in fact, all spare parts. 
we would increase retention uh, bonuses, improve base services at barracks. We would put $70 million per year for renovation of uh, single sailor barracks, uh, military construction for five barracks and reserve training center, improve berthing barges in Yokosuka, Japan. I think you get my point. Those sorts of things, um, they would continue to help support the changes in career CPAY, but we're going to do that anyway. So career CPAY is in and it'll stay in, the change that we put in. And there's one other thing I wanted to mention, Carolyn. Um, we would like to re, um, revisit what we call high deployment allowance. And uh, high deployment was, uh, it, by definition, is uh, greater than 190 days. If you go on a deployment, greater than 190 days by a, a, actually a DOD mandate and a, and a uh, law, you are required to get a high deployment allowance. We're on a waiver from that as a result of 9-11. So this has obviously a, been an old law and it's been in the books quite some time. We would propose, and we're still evaluating this with the Secretary of the Navy, but he's looking at it reasonably favorably, that we lift that waiver that we implement the payment of a high deployment allowance and that folks who are on longer deployments, greater than 190 days, receive that allowance. So more on that later, but, but that's another you know, initiative that, that these sorts of compensation reforms would help support. You're looking at money in a, in a sailor's pocket, but also improving where you go every day, especially if you're deployed on a ship and it's where you Precisely. are for, for yeah. months at a time. But where folks work, I, I want them to be uh, to be enabled where they work and to be prouder of the area that they work, in addition to feel that they're compensated reasonably. Admiral, how do you see all of this impacting the recruiting and retention for our shipmates? Well, Carolyn, that's hard to say. Uh, I, I'm not concerned, but we'll be vigilant. We'll look closely at this. What I'd like to do, we need to keep talking about this. We need to talk at the division officer level. We need to talk in the wardroom about what these mean. We at headquarters have to continue to put this out in what I call in English so folks can understand it. Uh, we need to work with the newspapers and the sites and the social media that our kids read. Uh, and so when they understand that, then we'll see, you know, what, what it, how they feel about that. How does that balance make sense to them? Today our recruiting is good, very good. Uh, we have no different issues than we've had for a long time. Um, medical folks are hard to recruit. Reserves are hard to recruit. But in general, we're meeting all of our goals and retention is very good as well. But we'll be vigilant. Absolutely. Admiral, um, focused on, on sailor impacts, but back to the, the budget, big mm -hmm. picture. You, you mentioned some hard choices. Um, what was your decision-making process, your thought process through through all of this? Well, uh, I looked at what what is the Navy required to do, all right? What is their primary mission? And and the the number one mission for us, defense of the homeland, and the, the, the ultimate defense of the homeland is our strategic nuclear deterrence. So for the Navy, it's called the sea-based strategic deterrence, and that's our, our Trident submarines and their follow-on, the Ohio Replacement Program. So it's the submarine, it's the missiles, it's the systems that support it. So that was number one. We had to make sure that we funded that properly. That, number two, we need to be where it matters in the world when it matters. So our forward presence has to be the best it can be. And we have to look for innovative and proper ways to be out there around the world supporting the Asia-Pacific rebalance and making sure we're in the Mideast at levels that make sense. So we can, again, we can respond to crises and do that. Those forces have to be ready. So it was presence with ready forces that are capable to respond uh, as necessary. Uh, we have certain capabilities that we bring that are unique uh, in the joint arena. The undersea domain, that's all ours. Uh, we own it today. So we had to continue to bring those capabilities in. Air-to-air -air capabilities, uh, electronic warfare capabilities. I call them asymmetric because they're different and they're better than just about any other, well, certainly than any other Navy in the world. We had to continue to bring those along. We also have readiness. Uh, now we have, the way we provide ready units to be where it matters, when it matters, we call it the fleet response plan. And it's almost like a conveyor belt. You go into maintenance and then basic training, and then integrated training, then you get like a kind of a capstone event, you know, called a uh, COM2X, uh, comprehensive uh, exercise, 
And then you go into deployment and, and maybe uh, response your, uh, to a contingency if necessary after that deployment. It's called sustainment phase. It's almost two years long. So that phase, or I'm sorry, that plan, that process, we tuned it up a little bit to make sure there's enough time to do maintenance. People get the right training, get the people to their units so that when it's time to get underway and train up to get ready to deploy, you got your crew on board. They're not arriving later. You're not cross-decking so much. So that element of readiness, we put a great bit of attention in. So again, those ships that are forward deployed out and around are as ready as they can be. And then lastly, we have to have an industrial base, uh, aircraft building uh, and shipbuilding especially, uh, an industrial base in the future so we can continue to build the future. If we were to not build enough ships or not build enough airplanes and folks closed, then I'd say, well, what am I going to do now? I don't have enough shipbuilders, you know, if we wanted to respond. And you can't just, you know, snap your fingers and say, hey, anybody want to build military ships? You know, those are special welders special ship field fitters at special locations. And, uh, and there's unique suppliers for U.S. Uh, shipbuilding that we have to watch, keep our eye on. Sounds like quite the balancing act of, you know, you've got a lot of different priorities and you hear a lot of talk about balancing readiness with force structure, which I think of yeah. as, you know, readiness as our ability yeah. to do the things we need to do and force structure is the, the stuff that we need yeah. to do the things that we need to do and be where it matters. Yeah. How did you balance those two priorities in, in this budget? Well, uh, we, what we looked at is uh, where, what is the need of our combatant commanders globally and, and how are we best suited to support the Asia-Pacific rebalance and make sure we protect, if you will, the Mideast and our interest in the Middle East. So we looked at, therefore, what kind, how many ships do we need forward? Well, today we have about 100 forward. That's about right, with the right capabilities, the right ships in the right regions. We look to the future and say, can we sustain that and grow appropriately? Want to try to do that, but at the same time build enough ships, because if you hold on to all your ships today and say, ah, I'll pay my bills, you know, or the reductions with shipbuilding. I won't build this ship, I won't build that submarine, and as you know, perhaps in the future, won't overhaul a carrier, because that's in the budget. And we have to balance that and say, eh, we're gonna have to maybe lay up or retire some ships and keep that money in building destroyers, building submarines, building aircraft carrier, airplanes, and all that's needed. So it's, um, some folks think, you know, you walk through it once and say, okay, looks pretty good. It, it's an iterative cycle that we loop back through. And, 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 you know, underpinning it all, we talked about earlier, our people. We're manned about right uh, as far as the number of people per unit, when, on average today. We don't have all the people in the right place, and they don't have all the right skill sets. So that's what we need to concentrate on. But, uh, Carolyn, what we can't do is just say, okay, let's just take 5,000 more people out of the Navy. You know, we... We buy equipment stuff, as you said earlier, and we man it. And we have to man that equipment properly. If I just reduce the manning, then I've reduced the number of people per unit. I can't do that. Well, Admiral, you touched on the, what I was going to bring up next, which are lots of news reports and conversations about the aircraft carrier. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what's in the budget um, mm -hmm. and then and the idea of decommissioning an aircraft carrier and how that impacts deployment cycles and, and sure. manning. Well, um, aircraft carrier overhauls require a lot of uh, long-range planning. I mean, that sounds obvious, but this is mostly long-range, what we're dealing with. So here, here's what I mean by that. The aircraft carrier in question is the George Washington. And the plan right now is for her to come back from Japan uh, when it's due for her reactor fuel to be replaced. And so that's a long overhaul of roughly four years. That overhaul is scheduled to start in September of 16, which is almost fiscal year 17, if you think about it. So let's just use that for rough. So during the fiscal year of 17, she will need to be start her refueling. So when we looked at the budget, we said, hmm, uh, I don't, we don't know if we're going to have that kind of money in the future. So let's, for now, put the, the program in a situation where we can either retire her in that fiscal year, in that 17 year, fiscal year 17, or refuel her. So we'll put the money in to bring her in, take the fuel out, and, and then next year we will address whether we're going to retire her or whether we're going to refuel her and keep her. 
Now, given that it's a four-year, she's offline for four years, until 2020 at least, and probably 2022, it really has no impact on the fleet. That, that carrier was going to come back and go into overhaul. So she was going to be out of service. So whether she's permanently out of service or she's being refueled, she's still not available to the fleet. Uh, so the impact on the fleet and their carrier rotation won't be felt till 2021 or 2022. And then the situation will be we will have one less carrier to provide presence. So it will be that much more difficult to maintain one carrier in the Gulf, one carrier in the Western Pacific. And that turnaround, you know, as I talked to you before for the fleet response plan, uh, will be more difficult to maintain. So my point to you is uh, we've set it up for an option to retire it or to overhaul it. And the monies for that uh, will have to be put in the 16 budget. So that's a decisional point when we build that budget and, and take it up to the Congress. It won't affect deployments for the near term because she was going to be, if you will, out of the fleet rotation for the next, goodness, well, starting in 16, really late 16 when she leaves Japan for at least the next five years. So, so sailors are, are safe in that plan and it's a decision that we'll, we'll make down the road. Yes, it is. Down the road would be actually uh, in the next, uh, say, five or six months uh, in the Navy, we will work our budget and, and see what is the proposal and as the Secretary of Defense indicated, we'll look at what the sense of the Congress is in retaining the amount of money we've requested, you know, through the future year defense plan. If that's the sense of the Congress or the intent, then we'll look hard at saying, okay, we think we can retain this carrier. So the Department of Defense will go into those deliberations. On another topic of, of ships staying in our fleet mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the cost to, to maintain and modernize them, What's, what's happening with the cruisers? Can oh. you tell us a little bit about <laughs> this, this phase yes. modernization plan and what happens to the sailors on those ships now? Sure. Well, um, again, we had some, a difficult decision to make. We, we look and say, we don't have enough money. There are 22 cruisers in the fleet today. We could keep, and I want to, if I had the money, keep all 22 of them and, and uh, operate them and modernize them so that they reach, they're in the most modern fashion and most capable to the end of their, their uh, life, their planned life. The problem is we don't have that kind of money. So we said, do we have to retire these ships and, and put them away forever? Or as we look at the sequencing of when they need to be modernized, 11 of, of these carriers, actually, uh, excuse me, cruisers, and, and they're the earliest one, which is counterintuitive, but the first 11 have been modernized. So if we keep those uh, operating, and we take the other 11, 20, and we put them, we lay them up in preparation for their modernization, and then pull them out and, and get into that modernization in a sequence as you go through the 20s, then uh, maybe we can retain that class of ship. Always have 11, because one of the original 11 retires, one of the later 11 will come back in. So it's a way to take 22 uh, cruisers maintain all of them on the books because they'll just be laid up. We could, we could bring them in as, as necessary or in a crisis. And then sequentially bring them in, modernize them, and bring them out into operation of the fleet, holding 11 across the board. When we uh, bring a ship, uh, one in for this long-term phase modernization, you know, you set it into the shipyard for a while, we will demand it down to a level that we haven't determined yet, but there'll be a minimal crew. Those folks and those billets don't go away. They go into the fleet where we currently have gap billets uh, afloat and ashore. And we'll continue to do that so that we continue to bring those skills and when it's time to man them, when we bring them back in, we'll have the right skill set and the right manpower. So, so this wouldn't be a reduction in force for the sailors. They'll just go to other, other billets ac across the fleet? Yes, okay. that's correct. Arma, we've talked about, about sailors, about compensation reform, uh, potential changes in force structure. Is there anything else that, that you'd like to add? Yeah, I'd like to uh, ask our folks, first of all, thank you for your service. All right, they, uh, Our sailors, these are very, very difficult decisions. And, and uh, people say, geez, I'm worried about, you know, we're not keeping faith in that. And, you know, I take that you know, very deeply uh, because they're doing an amazing job. Ask them to look and make sure that, um, that their opinions are well-founded and ask us questions. 
you know, get on those sites and, and ask, okay, what's the story on this? How does that work? Uh, and ask us questions uh, about the budget. Uh, they, when I go out and the Mick Pond and I have all hands calls, I'm astounded at the strategic vision that our kids have in there, and, and I think it's amazing. So we're very fortunate, and it is a foundation of, uh, we, we'll get through all of this with the right force, and we have the right force today. Admiral, thank you again for your time and for giving us your thoughts on the FY15 defense budget. We really appreciate your time. You're welcome. And we want to thank you for joining us for another segment of Conversation with a Shipmate. Be sure to stay on top of the entire series on the CNO's leadership page on Navy.mil and the Navy's official YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Lieutenant Caroline Hutchison. We'll see you next time for Conversation with a Shipmate.